Hello and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. Since the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014, eastern Ukraine has been a site of conflict. Russophones in Ukraine, armed by Russia and joined by Russian nationals, launched a revolt to break from Kiev. Following months of fighting, the area became a frozen conflict. Each week brings new casualties, but little territory has changed hands. Contributing host Doug Becker examines this conflict with a panel. In March 2014, Russia annexed the Ukrainian territory of Crimea, and a month later pro-Russian forces seized parts of Donetsk and Lansk in the eastern part of the country. Western nations, including the United States, responded by placing targeted economic sanctions against Russia and political sanctions, including the removal of Russia from the G8 economic group. Additionally, the United States provided assistance to Ukraine to aid in their fighting of a civil war between forces loyal to the government in Kyiv and those loyal to the government in Moscow. The war has cost over 14,000 lives. In today's Scholar Circle, we will examine the roots of the conflict in eastern Ukraine, the possibilities for resolution, and the role of external powers in the conflict. We are joined by Robert English, Professor of International Relations at the University of Southern California. Professor English is the author of Russia and the Idea of the West. Oksana Chevelle, Associate Professor of Political Science at Tufts University. Professor Chevelle is the author of Migration, Refugee Policy, and State Building in Post-Communist Europe. And Tor Bukvall, Senior Research Fellow at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. Professor Bukvall is the author of Fighting on Behalf of the State, the Issue of Pro-Government Militia Autonomy in the Donbass War. Rob English, we'll start with you. What are the roots of the war in eastern Ukraine? Thank you, Doug. There are extraordinarily complex political, economic, cultural, historical aspects to this conflict. Let me just say that in the more immediate context, we saw, for example, the failures of transition in the 90s and the return to power in various post-Soviet states, including Russia, of harder line or more nationalistic forces, the disillusion with the West, if you will. And we saw at the beginning of the 2000s, in the case of Russia, that meant the rise of Vladimir Putin. And, um, you know, a few years prior to the conflict breaking it out in Ukraine, the conflict in Georgia over, in a sense, precisely the same issues. Russia's red line, unwillingness to tolerate further expansion of the American-led military alliance uh, into the sort of Russian strategic area or Russian backyard. That was Georgia in 2008. And in some sense, we can see what happened in 2013, 2014, as roughly the same. When Ukraine um, went through a political revolution, a transition from a sort of Russia-leaning, Russia-friendly government to one that was strongly pro-Western, and declared its intentions to move fast on joining the EU and NATO, uh, Russia struck back. It was bigger than what happened in Georgia, but you can see a very clear strategic parallel. That's one way of looking at the conflict, that Russia simply decided it would not tolerate Ukraine breaking away from their orbit or their influence, at least not that dramatically, and joining these Western groupings, NATO and the EU. Therefore, it moved to cripple Ukraine or sever part of its territory. And Oksana Chevelle, in what ways is Ukrainian identity tied into their relationship with Russia? And what would motivate Ukraine to break with Russia, considering the history between the two countries? In Ukraine, as you know, there are many, not just ethnic Russians, but Russian-speaking people. There are connections on family levels. Uh, you know, historical levels and so forth between Ukrainian and Russian people. So I think it would be fair to say that certainly up until the conflict started, majority of Ukrainians were not anti-Russian in any sort of sense, right? But at the same time, you know, having close historical and cultural identity ties, it doesn't mean that the country cannot choose, say, to develop closer relations with the West, right? Um, And I think what we saw happen um, in 2014, um, after the Maidan revolution, the Euromaidan, um, that um, led to the ousting of President Yanukovych, 
there was a majority support actually even leading up to it, not huge majority, but there was a majority support for not joining NATO, but joining the EU. And just follow what Rob was just saying a minute earlier, that Russia, it was not just about NATO. I think it was broader kind of coming to terms with Ukraine, which in many Russians' minds is not really a separate country and Ukrainians are not really a separate nation. We see that in the polls, that many Russians to this day consider Ukrainians as sort of kind of fake nation or not really real nation. And certainly that was the thing, the sentiment in the political elite. So it wasn't just about NATO, which one might say maybe for security reasons was not such an unreasonable position. I think it was more generally Ukraine moving towards the West, even if it was in kind of non-military sense at this EU association agreement that Yanukovych promised to sign and then backtracked on. So I think identity uh, issues play in Ukraine in very complex ways. And one thing that Russians, um, Russian leadership has underestimated that many people who are Russian speakers, who consume Russian media, who read Russian literature, who have family in Russia, do not want to be part of Russia. For Ukrainians, it's not a contradiction in terms to be sort of in some sense culturally close to Russia, but want to have a separate political course for Ukraine as their country. And I think in Russia, there is very little understanding of that, unfortunately, at least among the political elite. And that's why we hear this discourse about Putin protecting Russian speakers. But if you look even at the capital city, Kiev, where majority of the population speaks Russian, which every election shows is very much pro-Western as opposed to pro-Russian. I think many in Russian political elites, it's very difficult to understand this nuance or this specificity of identity politics um, and identities in Ukraine. Tor Bukvall, from the perspective of the Russians and the military aid that the Russians have been giving Russophones or certainly pro-Russian fighters in eastern Ukraine, what's been the nature of that military aid and how directly have the Russians been involved in this conflict? You know, from the sources we have now, they've been very, very directly uh, involved. And that is also uh, exactly from the beginning. If I can just add to what my colleagues said previously, I agree with everything they said. I just think it's important to say that there's, there may be a distinction between why there is a conflict in eastern Ukraine and why there is an armed conflict in eastern Ukraine. So I think my colleagues very well explained why there is a conflict, but it didn't necessarily have to become uh, armed or, uh, or military conflict based on what they said. So the military character of it, that's uh, a result of Russian direct Russian military interference. I don't think, however, that the military interference in eastern Ukraine was as planned as the one in Crimea. And even in Crimea, one can question that. But I think in the case of eastern Ukraine, in the case of the Donbass and Luhansk, it was more a question, uh, or they will, they started to try to use some military, um, military force to see how that went. Basically, I think they would, they wanted to use a little bit of military force covered in order to ignite rebellion. And they succeeded to a small extent, but not really big enough to become a problem for Kiev. And therefore, <clears throat> Russia also decided to use its own military uh, together with, uh, with the small uprising they were able to create internally in Donbass. And then kind of together, the Russian military, Russian volunteers, and also people from the Donbass taking up arms, that together created the, the military uh, aspect of the conflict. Now, Rob English, you described this as sort of you know, Russia deciding that uh, they needed to intervene to make sure Ukraine doesn't, whether it's join NATO or, or drift out of the Russian orbit. Is this conflict in eastern Ukraine largely driven by Russia and Russian interests, or how much of it is internal in Ukraine? Are we speaking not of Crimea now, but just of the Donbass, Donetsk and Luhansk? Yeah, uh, speaking of Donbass. Because I would give different answers if we were talking about Crimea. But the Donbass region, it's very difficult to tell because now for some time the region uh, has been disintegrated from Ukraine. In other words, cut off, controlled by unelected leaders, highly militarized. So public opinion, free travel, journalists, uh, you know, reporting there is very difficult. I have the impression um, that it's very much driven by Russian support and a minority of highly militant warlords, if we can call them that, um, are calling the shots that much of the population goes about its life as best it can, keeping its head down, certainly not speaking out, and would prefer the conflict to end, 
Um, certainly everybody wants that, but they would prefer some kind of compromise. They are not the extremists who, you know, foresee outright secession and uh, unification with Russia. No, it doesn't, doesn't mean that they don't have reservations about uh, the other side as well. Kiev has done really boneheaded things all the way through to alienate uh, some of the Russian, ethnic Russian or Russian speaking population. But it doesn't mean, therefore, that most of the people in Donetsk support the extremists who are in power now, support the, you could call, I call them warlords. Maybe that's not the best term. I, I don't know a better answer to that. I can tell you much more about public opinion in the rest of Ukraine, where we have exhaustive polling, we have a free press, and uh, we know very well all kinds of regional differences, political, military, social, economic issues. In Donetsk, it's militarized and chilling. Can I just jump in on this? Just to add um, yes, to, what, to what uh, Rob was saying, I think if we look at the beginning of the conflict, and I think it also goes back to Thor's point that to explain conflict and to explain armed conflict is a little bit different thing, right? I think there was clearly a lot of um, unhappiness in the Donetsk and Luhansk region when Yanukovych was driven away, right? Sort of the, the way Euromaidan won, and there was also, you know, some violence during Euromaidan. So there were, you know, we can say objectively existing and maybe to some extent legitimate or at least not surprising grievances that some part of the population there had. But there is a big jump from that to actually armed rebellion. And here I think it would be useful to recall some parallels with events in 2004 when there was also kind of pro-Western, we can say, uprising in Ukraine when Yushchenko and Yanukovych f faced each other in the presidential elections and Yanukovych originally fraudulently won and then the election results were um, annulled by the Constitutional Court following mass protests. So there were also movement in eastern Ukraine. There was even this short-lived announced creation of the Southern Ukrainian People's Republic or something along those lines. But at that time, Russia played a very different role. There was no Russian involvement and essentially over time the elites in the, you know, Kiev, sort of the winning government, pro-Western government, and these local elites in Donetsk and Luhansk were able to find common ground. And essentially, yes, there was conflict, there was tension, but there was no armed violence. But I think 2014 was very different, not least, to my mind, I think very importantly, because of the Crimea precedent. So once Crimea was seized, that sort of expanded the potential sort of circle of possibilities, right? Now you are protesting, what exactly do you want? Well, maybe we want the same thing as in Crimea. And then if we take into account the Strelkov incursion in Slavyansk, the armed groups, you know, that came from Crimea with Russian support to Slavyansk. So, you know, I think it would be useful to keep both of these factors in mind that, yes, there were some domestic local grievances, but it didn't mean that people want succession. And probably, again, we can't really say definitively how events would have unfolded, but I think 2004 provides useful parallel how Ukrainians could have probably been able to solve their differences peacefully as they have all the way from 1991 onwards through the very difficult 90s and through the early 2000s. But Russia played a very different role in 2014. And I think if we're talking about armed violence, that's a very important piece of the explanation. Tor Bookfall, is this an example, I suppose, of, of a bit of a security paradox where you're seeing this the arming of the groups in, in eastern Ukraine partially driven because of the concerns with the Russian annexation of Crimea, but also concerns that once both actors saw conflict is becoming a bit more inevitable, and it, these were events that were spinning out of control. How much of this is external because the Russians have had annexed Crimea oh, a yeah, month earlier, yeah. and that these were <laughs> events that could have been managed peacefully, but ended up becoming securitized and, and militarized because events sort of spun out of control? I think we probably shouldn't talk about the armed rebellion in Donbass as Russia supported. It's more, I would say, Russia controlled, almost from the beginning. Then this doesn't necessarily mean that Moscow and the leaders of the Inuit republics have exactly the same agenda all the time. They probably don't. And there are also there have been a lot of shifts in the leadership in these republics, probably prompted by Moscow. But still, this is in essence, it is something that is largely controlled by Moscow. And I think it had some quite a lot probably of local support in the beginning, at least among those who thought that Donbass would go the same way as Crimea. So it would not be a lot of fighting and it would, uh, after a short while, also these areas uh, could possibly be uh, integrated into Russia. But when it was clear that this would not happen, then I think the Donbass rebellion suffered significantly in terms of, uh, of recruitment. And after that, they have been kind of, it's been a problem throughout for the military structures in these areas to, to fill their ranks, so to say. They, they fill them with 
with locals to some extent, but at least as much by volunteers from Russia. I agree that it was probably at least partly internally driven in the very beginning, but with the Russian military component there all along. But now it's more more run by Moscow, and it's true that it's very difficult to get any reliable picture of what the popular opinion is in this area about their own future. But the few surveys that have come out tend to suggest that although the people there now are extremely fed up with Kiev and they are extremely anti-Kiev, they would be ready for almost any solution as long as it brings peace. You're listening to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Doug Becker. We've been discussing the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Today's panel is Robert English of the University of Southern California, Oksana Cheval of Tufts University, and Tor Bukval of the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. So, Rob English, it seems this conflict is certainly one of these sort of typical cases where you have external actors intervening with their interests and a local population that's pretty exasperated by conflict. First, is that a pretty accurate way to describe what's going on in eastern Ukraine? It's the battlefield, but the local population really doesn't want this war. And I guess related to that is then is the secret to get external actors out, to get the Russians out, and perhaps what the government in Kiev need to do to try to decrease tensions? I guess the answer to your, the first part of your question is yes, Tor just answered that better than I could. In other words, local people are sick of it all, just want peace, and would be willing to accept all manner of compromise. On the second, I think what you said was, if it is being fueled by external actors, then how do you get Russia out? Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Well, that's the real question. In other words, you're asking in a different way, how do we get to a peace settlement from where we are now? And let me answer it this way. As I look around, I see people answering that question in basically two different ways. One is there's got to be compromise, and the other is Russia has to leave, or Russia has to be defeated, or Russia has to be made through sanctions, through other pain, to back off. In other words, Russia is the guilty party. Russia needs to stop being guilty. That's a very principled position because it kind of flows from much of what we've been saying, that Russia was the first to militarize this, that for whatever reasons having to do with its own insecurity or geopolitical perspectives or what have you, its own opinion of NATO, Russia was the aggressor. From that, the sort of fair-minded ethical person wants to say, therefore, the onus is on Russia to concede. And I tend to the other point of view, not from an ethical perspective, but simply from a practical one. I don't think Russia will. I don't think Russia can be persuaded. Uh, Russia, we've done our best to sanction them, isolate Russia. Like it or not, as distasteful as compromise with a bad guy is, we do it all the time in international relations. And what am I saying in a long-winded way, which is, uh, I suppose, the following. Regardless of how angry you are at Putin for this and many other actions, how sympathetic you are to Kiev, to the Ukrainian point of view, um, or anything else, if you want to end this conflict, and you want to do what you asked, Doug, which is improve the lives of the people living there and Ukrainians in general, then there's going to have to be compromise and we'll have to get swallow the bitter pill of dealing with a bad guy. And frankly, I don't know what's so surprising about this. I see more and more parallels every time this is analyzed to what happened in the ex-Yugoslavia. We are talking now about a deal with Milosevic, aren't we? We're talking about a Dayton Accord for Eastern Ukraine, where the Bosnian Serbs, i.e. the Donetsk Russian separatists, are not punished, are not made to fully concede and go back to status quo ante. That didn't happen in the former Yugoslavia and is not going to happen here. Um, So it's distasteful. But if that was a success, Dayton and ending the war in Bosnia, uh, I don't see any model or parallel at hand that's better because there's not going to be a victory for the forces of Ukrainian side in in Ukraine. Uh, That moment has passed, that appetite on the part of the US and certainly on the part of the Europeans to keep standing up and pressuring Russia and hoping Putin will concede, that time has passed. So like it or not, we're forced to think about compromise, even if it's distasteful.
Oksana Chevelle, you've referenced the uh, Maiden Revolution a couple of times. And, you know, sort of returning, you know, to that, we know that revolution was really about replacing a more pro-Russian leader in Yanukovych with a more pro, for lack of a better term, pro-European leader in Poroshenko. We have this new president, Zelensky. And well, I... well, hang on. Poroshenko comes in a lot later. Okay. It was an interim government, and Poroshenko wasn't a comp- competitor at that time. Okay. But the result of the revolution certainly was a key that was much more oriented towards Europe and away from Moscow, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And mm-hmm. so now we have this new leader, Zelensky, who I think it's fair to say we're not really all that certain where he falls on this question. But if, if Rob's correct and there needs to be some form of, of compromise, is Zelensky the sort of leader that would be likely to make these compromises? Well, I think it's undisputable that there needs to be some kind of compromise. In other words, the hope that Russia would just pack up their bags and leave and things go back to the way they were, you know, probably really unrealistic, as Rob was saying. But I think what really matters is what kind of compromise we're talking about, right? And I think the Bosnia analogy, I'm not sure how applicable it is in in no small part because of the identity differences. I mean, the boundary between, certainly after the war between, say, the Serbs and the Croats, I think was much sharper than we have the boundary in Ukraine. So, but back to the point um, of Zelensky, um, what what is he all about? I think when he got elected, right, especially being a comedian, right, not being in politics before, I think people voted for him for all sorts of reasons. There were certainly people, and I know many such people personally, who basically believed he's going to continue more or less pro-Western course of Poroshenko, probably not sort of maybe as drastically, especially when it came to cultural policies, but overall he's going to be more pro-Western, but he'll say be less corrupt. And that was sort of his appeal to part of the population. Now, another part of the population, especially in the east and south of the country, voted for him kind of hoping that he will really reverse some of these more kind of most pro-Western, most we can say kind of pro-Ukrainian and cultural sense and anti-Russian um, you know, uh, policies of Poroshenko. So he really kind of attracted very different audiences. And I think ultimately it would be impossible for him to satisfy all of his, you know, electorate that chose, that voted for him. But as far as compromise, I mean, in Ukraine, they like to talk about so-called red lines. In other words, like, yes, we want to compromise. We agree some compromise is necessary, but there are certain red lines that we cannot cross. And at least so far, what we heard from Zelensky and I think the outcome of this Normandy summit last week shows that, he really is not prepared to cross these fundamental red lines, which for Ukraine, one is the so-called federal, federal status for these regions within the country, which essentially means that these um, Donetsk and Luhansk are currently non-government controlled territories would receive a special status that would give them a veto power within Ukrainian domestic and especially foreign policy. That's what ultimately Russia wants. Like that would be a victory for Russia. I don't think they really care about these regions. They really see that as a way to prevent exactly that pro-Western turn um, in Ukraine. And if these regions were incorporated in Ukraine with constitutional amendments that would give them the right to veto Ukrainian foreign policy choices at the national level, I mean, that would be, we can say, sort of full defeat of Ukraine, for lack of a better word, and victory for Russia. I don't think that's likely under Zelensky. He made it very clear that this is not where he's going. Now, that said, the room for compromise remains quite broad. So, yes, Ukraine committed to giving this region special status. What does what would it really entail? It may entail things such as, say, greater linguistic rights, right, which Again, many in Ukraine, the nationalists are not going to like this, but is this really detrimental to Ukrainian national interests? I don't think so. And it certainly, you know, speaks to satisfy some of Russian, at least openly expressed concerns, right, for the rights of Russian speakers and so forth. And then say amnesty again, like, yes, Ukraine commits to amnesty, but who's going to get amnesty? Everybody, say, you know, some school teachers who were forced to organize referendum in 2014, or, you know, commanders of these armed groups that shot Ukrainian prisoners and so forth, right? So... I think this is where, you know, the Zelensky team really has to be quite sort of, you know, getting down to work and figuring out these specific compromises. So I certainly would agree with the argument that Ukraine would need to compromise in order for this conflict to end, that we cannot just expect for Russia to say like, okay, we're going to pack our bags and go home. But what kind of compromise it will be, and especially given the terms of the Normandy, of two Minsk agreements, and the fact that Ukraine does have some support from France and Germany, Right. If Ukraine were to offer a reasonable compromise, that would still be compromised given sort of Ukraine's ideal position, but it would not go as far as what Russia would ultimately want, as far as having these regions, giving them the ability to veto Ukrainian foreign policy choices for years to come. 
I think that would be something that Zelensky might be able to achieve. It sounds like you referenced some of the policies of European states and the possibility of perhaps some political pressure on Kyiv, on President Zelensky, to make some compromises. Torbukval, first of all, can you see European states wanting to put this pressure on Ukraine to try to make those compromises? And is this something that, that the EU or I guess generally that Europe could play a much more sort of positive role at trying to arrive at some sort of resolution? <laughs> well, I, I have to admit I'm, I'm not very optimistic in this regard. There are probably different opinions on this issue also in Europe, and it may be that the French presidents, for instance, is, would be more willing to put pressure on Kiev than other presidents in order, or other leaders of European countries in order to get a solution. But I don't really see this... Um, uh, this going very far. I think the point is exactly as Oksana said that yes, compromise, but what kind of compromise? And um, what Moscow wants is for these areas to be part of Ukraine, to be paid for by Ukraine, but to be at least partly controlled politically by Moscow. And I cannot see any Ukrainian leadership accepting that. And I also don't think that even European countries w uh, would. Uh, for try to force Kyiv to do that. No state is going to accept part of its country partly politically controlled by another other country. So actually, I only really see two ways out here. Either there's a change, total change of regime in Russia, and that's not very likely, at least at the moment, or the sanction regime over time, and then I'm talking about years, become so painful that uh, Moscow at some point starts to look for a way out where they get something, but where they will not get control of these areas. They will just, uh, I mean, seeking something that will cover their, uh, uh, save their face, so that they could try at least to sell internally that uh, they got something out of the investment they are put in by supporting or and even controlling Mr. Bell. With uh, the possibility of European pressure being a bit less likely or you know, perhaps pessimistic, I know one of the reasons why Ukraine has been in the news so frequently is because of American policy and what appears to be at least some degree of conditionality on the part of the Americans, the conditionality on their support for Ukraine based on some domestic political issues in the United States. So Rob English, in what ways has recent American policy complicated or enabled or what influence has it had on the possibility of a peace agreement in Ukraine? Could I answer a different question and basically deflect that to Oksana, who probably understands far better than I do and can interpret how the impeachment process and the scandal in Washington is impacting Zelensky, his independence, his strength of position, and so forth. I'd like to finish up with the preceding point Absolutely. and just ask the following. When I think about the question you raised and what Tor was saying, what's going to happen over time? What could break this deadlock? Um, I, I often tend to think in terms of whose power is growing and whose is weakening, whose position is getting stronger and whose is getting weaker. And I don't see, thought in those terms, Russia conceding, Russia becoming. In other words, one scenario that was held out was the sanctions and, and isolation and so forth over time uh, are so painful that Russia changes course. Um, they're not going to get more painful than they've been. They just aren't. And Russia has survived them. Russia has in some ways thrived. We see instead pressure in Europe and European business that are tired of the lost you know, deals with Russia um, going forward with the Nord Stream pipeline, going forward with so much else, violating sanctions anyway, that the power gradient, if you will, is in Moscow's favor. What's more, don't think of Ukraine as something stable. Ukraine is in an awful condition, right? Ukraine slipped. Uh, U Ukraine might have signed an association agreement with the EU in the spring of 2014, right? The one that Yanukovych had spurned. And even with duty-free exports to Europe and vis-a-vis -vis tr free travel in Europe, Ukraine has suffered terribly economically. It sank down to being the poorest country in Europe, you know, down there in the League of Kosovo and, and Moldova. I don't see that any government in Ukraine, if it can't show some economic results in fighting corruption and in people, improving people's standard of living, is going to last long in any case. That, that it has the domestic base of support. 
to negotiate toe to toe with Putin or anyone else or, or stand up to Macron or Merkel for that matter. Um, I see Zelensky as having a very brief honeymoon. He was elected with, what, 73% of the vote. His popularity is down to 53% now. And, and you know, even Which when we look Ukraine at... is still huge. Historically, nobody gets more than 15. So <laughs> that's another kind well, of interesting feature yeah, of but, Ukrainian but, politics. But, but, look, look, but again, all what I'm saying now, when I think of these power gradients, who can stay the course longer and whose position will strengthen or weaken over time? Russia's is not going to weaken significantly. It might even strengthen. Zelensky's is weakening rapidly. Maybe 53% is high historically, but it's 20 points down from six months ago. So all I'm saying is um, let's be realistic about what can be achieved. Sanctioning Russia into concessions isn't going to work. It hasn't worked now when Russia suffered for two years with negative economic growth. How do we expect it to work going forward when oil prices have risen, when Russia has new deals with China and investors from everywhere else? You know, I'm, I know I'm being long winded here, but you've got we've got to be realistic. So let me just close with one observation. Right. Five years ago, the expectation was the sanctions would cripple Russia. We cut off all these projects, especially those that would hurt them where it hurts most. In other words, generating income from petroleum. Instead, we see Russia has managed to complete four major projects. South Stream is going forward, Turkish Stream, if you will, the North Stream 2 pipeline, the Power of Siberia pipeline. That was supposed to be impossible. And a major new LNG export terminal up on the Yamal Peninsula. Plus, they completed this uh, infrastructure, this bridge, rail and road link across Kerch, right, to unite Crimea with Russia. Go back four years, everybody was predicting, no way Russia can do this. Russia, this is going to really hurt. They're not, And instead, they're gushing in new energy income. So I don't see hanging, stick, staying the course, changing the power gradient there. So I know, I don't mean to sound pro-Russian, but I mean to sound realistic because the current policy isn't working. Sometimes I feel as if we're debating a Cuba embargo again. That hasn't worked well either. And we keep staying the course. Akshana Chevelle, first of all, your response to that, uh, to the argument that it's not working, so so something else needs to be done. Well, I guess I'll be saying like what exactly is not working and what exactly needs to be done because I mean Russia they do care about sanctions. I was in Moscow not that long ago talking to various people there from the foreign ministry and so forth and you know, they really want the sanctions lifted. So it's not to say like, yes, it hasn't crippled them to the point there is some sort of regime collapse, right? I think also another thing we need to keep in mind that, you know, it sort of reminds me of the late days of the Soviet Union, that everything looks stable until it wasn't stable anymore, right? So, I mean, we have a lot of dissatisfaction in the Russian population for all sorts of, you know, corruption reasons and so forth. The largesse that uh, Putin regime is getting, I mean, there have been books and articles written on this topic, how it is really serving his primarily inner circle and people close to him, and, you know, people in Russia know that. But I'm not saying that we should expect Russian regime to collapse. What I'm saying is that, the terms of the Minsk Accord, in a way, already provide the kinds of concessions that Ukraine is expected to make and that Russia agreed to agree to. So I don't think there is really necessary to reinvent the wheel here, right? I think it is more of the terms of these agreements. Like, for example, it says the region is supposed to get special status. Like, the way kind of special status that Russia wants is very different from the kind of special status that Ukraine is willing to give it. I see no reason to expect that Russia would be able to force Ukraine to give it that particular status, right? Now, as far as uh, Ukraine economic performance, I mean, certainly it has its share of problems. There has been a lot of corruption historically and in the recent years. Zelensky, I wouldn't underestimate the fact that he still remains so popular. Like, yes, his support dropped, but they have engaged in a lot of anti-corruption reforms. Um, some of them clearly positive, some maybe more like mixed bag. Um, they seem to be determined um, to improve economic situation. They just received the IMF loan in Ukraine. The national currency is very strong. So I don't think Ukraine is facing any kind of sort of like economic collapse. And the silver lining of this worsening relations with Russia has been in the past several years that Ukraine was actually able to establish energy independence. So it is not as reliant on Russian gas as it has been um, in the past. So it, I mean, yes, like it's costly, it's not a cost-free proposition. But I guess, I mean, probably my overall take is maybe somewhat less pessimistic than what Rob has outlined. I'm not saying things he's saying are not accurate, but there are kind of two ways of looking at how stable and successful Russian regime is. I think there are potentially different way of looking at how much problem Zelensky is facing and what to make of the fact that he has only 53% support and no longer 75% support. 
and the economic sort of these projects that Russia is engaging in, does it mean that Putin can kind of get away with anything he wants? I'm not so sure. But going specifically back to the solution to the Ukraine, the problem in Eastern Ukraine, the Donbass crisis, I think the specifics of negotiation of the Minsk agreement, I think that's what it's going to come down to. And as I said, you know, Zelensky sees certain red lines that he's not prepared to cross. I don't see France or Germany pushing him in the direction to actually cross these specific lines. Like, yes, they want him to compromise and to have this region special status. But I don't think France and Germany are on the same page with Russia as to what kind of status this region has to have. They just today actually submitted amendments to the constitution of Ukraine in the parliament. The text of the amendments is not yet been made public. But apparently the amendments specifically are aimed at increasing decentralization in the country to all the regions, including Donbass, which would be presented as Ukraine complying with terms of the Minsk Accord. So I think Ukraine is definitely in a difficult situation, not to say the conflict will be solved tomorrow. But I guess overall, I'm somewhat less um, optimistic maybe um, than Rob is on the prospects. Akshana Chevelle. You had said that the Ukrainians have a very different interpretation of special status than the Russians do. Do you have any specific examples of that? I think for Russians, the special status ultimately amounts to these regions having a veto power, you know, on the national level, most importantly on foreign policy. So if, say, there is some sort of, say, at some point in the future, referendum to join, you know, NATO or the EU, that these regions would, some, the special status would be such that these regions could essentially veto it. That's not the kind of special status Ukrainian government is willing to give to any region in the country, because that would really create kind of a confederal state, and Ukraine defines itself as a unitary state. On the other hand, say special status in taxation, in economic affairs, right? So say there may be more like cross-border trade and other economic relations with Russia without seeking approval from Kiev. Some sort of linguistic and or cultural rights. I mean, Ukraine has one language only, has a status of state language, but these regions might receive Russian to be given the status of official language in these regions, right? That would be a concession from the part of the central government. That would be another example. Another example that's also actually listed in the Minsk peace agreement, that there's supposed to be a local police force, the militia, that would be um, appointed or selected by the local self-government. So again, hypothetically speaking, say we have local elections that Ukrainian central government recognizes, and then there is local police force, which would presumably include a lot of people who are now serving in the LNR, DNR security, you know, armed forces, that would become local police. I mean, that's a huge concession on the part of Ukraine. How exactly it would be instituted, to what extent they would be controlled um, by the central government or not, I think is an open question. But these are the kinds of specific elements of the special status that Ukrainian government is considering and that are also reflected in the Minsk uh, peace agreements. Right, but they don't go as far as creating so-called federalism in the country um, with certain regions being able to veto national policies, which is exactly what Russia wants. And I don't think Russia is getting any support for its position from either Western allies or you know, people in Ukraine, even the more pro-Russian people. There is very little support for federalism in Ukraine, as opinion polls show in the government-controlled areas. Tor Bukval, it seems like one of the issues that keeps coming up as I'm listening to these conversations is sort of the future profile of Ukrainian foreign policy. And there's a couple of red lines, to use the phrase, that, that's been raised, including things like, obviously, formally, if Ukraine were to apply to join NATO or the EU, that would be something that would certainly raise the ire of the Russians. Is there any sort of conversation about changing the Ukrainian status in any of the European institutions or extending any sort of protections, whether it be military protections or political protections to the Ukrainians? Or is this fear the Russians have of sort of Ukraine becoming more European and less Russian? Is it more conceptual or are there actually some proposals on the table? The European countries cannot, in terms of NATO at least, it's very difficult to say that one country can never become a member of NATO, because that would be to give veto right on who's, become, uh, who's to become members of NATO to Russia. So NATO cannot do that. At the same time, the appetite for taking Ukraine into NATO, I think, is very little. So I, I don't think that's very likely. I know less about the EU. I think that's more to do with to what extent Ukraine is able to shape up at home. As we have heard discussed throughout this conversation, Ukraine is in a really bad situation at home. Uh, but they are, to some extent now at least, trying to, to rectify that. But I think EU membership would be more a question of how, uh, how they do at home. Basically, I, I think that European powers 
talk about the European prospects or Ukraine, but neither EU nor NATO is ready to actually change that and, and take Ukraine in in any way. So I think for the foreseeable future, we will see verbal support and support in terms of, of um, reforms and probably also a lot of economic support for Ukraine. But I think we're a long way away from membership in any of these institutions. Now, Rob English, you mentioned how the Ukrainians needed to clean up corruption. And certainly the issue of corruption in Ukraine has been pretty dominant in the press, dominant in American politics, et cetera. First off, are the Ukrainians cleaning up their corruption? And is that the fundamental sort of political reform that you see Zelensky needing to embrace? Or what are some of the other political reforms that he would need to address in order to stabilize or modernize or you know try to overcome some of uh, Ukraine's domestic problems? It is corruption. I don't know what you might be referring to with political reforms. They have a, a good constitution, mm. at least on paper, elections, you know, institutions. The setup is fine, but it's not working well. And yeah, yeah, corruption is issue number one. Corruption is is horrible. Corruption is an enormous drain, um, not just on ordinary citizens' daily lives, but it interferes with both the success of domestic development projects and the ability to attract foreign investment, right? Those could all be flourishing, um, at least much more successful than they are. So there's a huge opportunity cost. We can see direct costs, and then there are these other costs of what might have been but is forsaken because of the sky high level of corruption. Um, is Zelensky succeeding? It's way too early to say. Um, and I, I won't surprise you that I'm the cynic or the skeptic here in the group, at least on this one, I'll you know embrace that <laughs> happily um, and say, how many times have we seen in Russia, in Ukraine, in Serbia, in, in you, you name it, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, another round of uh, a new election, a new government, a new anti-corruption program. And um, they're almost um, you know honored more in the breach. I'm not saying by any stretch that Zelensky isn't sincere. Here I think he is. But the problem is enormous, and it's not just a matter of his political will or of the allies he's chosen, but it's just a damned hard thing to do. And I would again caution about one thing, which is letting our hopes get in the way of reality. I'll point something out. After the Maidan revolution, over the next four years, Ukraine improved significantly in Transparency International's corruption rankings. And you know how Transparency International does that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they do polls and they have some quantitative data. Um, and then you notice if you looked at the opinion polling within Ukraine, ordinary Ukrainians said, are you kidding? Um, bribe taking is worse than ever. Corruption has grown with this uh, Poroshenko government, or at least under it, at least in my region, whether it's in Odessa or whether it's in, um, you know, in, in, in Western Ukraine, in Lviv. So how striking that ordinary Ukrainians, when asked, said things are as bad or worse than ever. But the um, sort of Western NGO that's the gold standard in corruption immediately saw Ukraine on the right path. Why? Because they declared a lot of things. But it turns out declaring and doing are very different. So clearly that's the larger point I'm making, uh, along with just healthy respect for how many times this has been promised and tried before and, and how deeply difficult it is to reform in any meaningful way, right? You can pass a law, you can create a national you know, anti-corruption bureau, you can pass regulations saying that state officials have to declare their assets or they can't have this conflict of interest. This is not the first time we've seen the legislative not have the policy results it's supposed to. So I think it's gonna be very slow. We need to have lower expectations and a lot of patience, but it's absolutely the top priority. I'm Doug Becker. You're listening to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. We've been discussing the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Today's panel is Robert English of the University of Southern California, Oksana Cheval of Tufts University, and Tor Bukval of the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. So, Oksana Cheval, I had asked this question of Rob, and he kind of parried it on to you. With the contemporary American politics being so centered on Ukrainian corruption and American conditional support for the Ukrainians in this war. How much is the U.S. complicating 
the conflict in Ukraine or complicating Ukrainian uh, local politics, support for Zelensky. What's the impact of the scandal in the U.S. on Kiev? Well, I think probably the main impact is that this bipartisan support that Ukraine sort of relied on and uh, was hoping to continue enjoying, I think is much more difficult now because obviously, you know, if the president of Ukraine was kind of thrown in the middle um, of this um, debate over whether or not Trump pressured him, right, if you say, I think he's really in the no-win situation because if you say that, you know, he uh, didn't pressure him, it serves kind of strengthening Trump and maybe upsetting the Democrats, right, and the other way around. So I think that kind of erosion or potential erosion of bipartisan support, I would say probably is the main consequence. I think um, the current administration in Ukraine is right to kind of try to distance themselves as much as possible uh, from this, um, you know, the developments um, and the impeachment process um, in the U.S. And uh, hopefully, I think what they're also hoping that behind the scenes um, that support will continue, but say even in the Normandy meeting, uh, for a while, the ideas were floated that the U.S. might be brought on board as one of the parties to be involved in this conflict resolution. That clearly has not happened and is very unlikely to happen. But then again, like it, it, I think it would have been unlikely to happen anyway, because Russia has always been strongly against uh, bringing U.S. in this process. So, um, so it's not to say there has been no impact, but I think uh, the main impact um, is about sort of potential erosion of bipartisan support. And then I think also kind of the bad reputation that Ukraine has gotten um, at least in the popular media and in the U.S. as this like super corrupt country. And that, I think, uh, goes to somewhat devalue uh, the efforts that current administration is making uh, to fight corruption. And um, I totally would agree here um, with what was just said um, by Rob, that we shouldn't be too optimistic that to expect big results. At the same time, I think what is different now is that unlike uh, pretty much any previous president, Zelensky actually enjoys majority support in the parliament. They have single party majority, which is really unprecedented um, in Ukrainian political history since 91. So they are able to pass legislation much faster and they don't have to sort of engage in this compromises and satisfying various oligarchs and having clauses in the legislation that would serve the interests and so forth. So I think um, it's probably as good a time as any in contemporary Ukrainian political history, assuming the government indeed is committed to anti-corruption reforms to actually clean house much more effectively than it has been done um, in the past. But that said, I think it's true that it's, it's a complicated process. There are a lot of special interests. There is a huge problem with the courts in Ukraine that president or parliament cannot change single-handedly. So we really shouldn't expect dramatic improvement. Um, but again, I would say there are some reasons to be cautiously optimistic that this time we actually might see substantial progress on the anti-corruption front. So we have a couple of minutes left, and I have one specific question. I'll start with Rob. One of the things that has me particularly interested in this conflict is this pattern of Russian behavior vis-a-vis the former Soviet republics and this kind of carving out of areas of Russophones where, I mean, in some fairly extreme circumstances, like in Moldova, the Russians have supported an independence movement. And obviously, in the case of Georgia, had invaded the country in order to support independence movements. But there seems to be this pattern in Russian uh, behavior vis-a-vis the former republics of an aggressive policy in support of, of Russophones. And this, the conflict in eastern Ukraine seems to fit that pattern. And I know one of the concerns is if Russia, for lack of a better term, gets away with it, it's just going to encourage a continuation of this, these kinds of campaigns in other places, in the Baltics or in you know, the Caucasus region, et cetera. Is this a legitimate concern? And how much should that concern guide Western policies, uh, Western reactions to the Russian campaign in eastern Ukraine? We'll start with Rob English. Uh, the short answer is I don't think so. No, it's not a legitimate concern, at least not quite in the sort of one-dimensional way you presented it. As Oksana pointed out before and as has come up in other parts of the discussion, you know, we've had 25 years now of post-Soviet Russia um, and ability to um, deal with these issues and compromise over the Russian-speaking population or the ethnic Russian population, other republics. And arguably, uh, Russia has been fairly passive in ways that uh, we see far more assertive defensive co-nationals on the part of uh, certain Central European leaders, let's say. 
Um, Russia made a lot of noise in the 90s about the discrimination against Russian speakers in the Baltics. Uh, you know, in Ukraine, when you or say Moldova, in in Georgia, um, look where we are. We're in 2009. What sparked the intervention in Georgia was not a sudden concern for the fate of Russian speakers. It was Georgia under Saakashvili aggressively, you know, moving to join NATO. Uh, Ossetians are not defended as ethnic Russian population because they're not. They're Ossetian. Um, they happen to speak Russian, but that's not even their first language. Their first language is Ossetian. This is a completely different issue from ethnic Russians in, let's say, Eastern Estonia. My point in the long timeline is to remind people that Putin didn't create these conflicts. Yeltsin didn't create these conflicts. Ladies and gentlemen, they started under Mr. Gorbachev, right? The uh, Pridnestrovia, right? So the Transnistria, as it's often called, region in Eastern Moldova, right? Declared when Moldova moved rapidly towards independence and towards potential unification with Romania and in a very strong Romanization direction, they pulled away under Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, the conflicts in Abkhazia and South Ossetia also date to the Gorbachev era. Both of those regions essentially declared independence from Georgia out of anger at what the Georgians were doing when Boris Yeltsin was preoccupied with preparations for the, I mean, he wasn't even in the driver's seat yet. It was still Gorbachev and we had Russia collapsing. We had the coup in the fall of 91. People need to remember these were not manufactured by Russia and Russia came in relatively late. Yes, Russia has more recently uh, use these for geopolitical leverage. And and I think that directly goes back to Russia's unwillingness to accept countries like Georgia and Ukraine right in its soft underbelly becoming NATO bases. That's the key issue. So it's not a policy of progressive expansion in support of Russophones, which implies that Latvia or Lithuania, I'm sorry, Latvia or Estonia are next and who knows after. It's It's very defensive. It might be aggressive or brutal, but it's essentially defensive. And it was only right the, the movement of NATO further and further east. You know, what happened in 2008 when under President Bush, Georgia and Ukraine were both put on the list for a membership action plan that Russia turned this sharply aggressive. Before that, these weren't issues. They were simmering conflicts, but they had to do with the local population, not Russia. And then Shana Cheval, your response? You know, to follow on this discussion about Russia's role towards, you know, defense so-called of Russian speakers, I think it's, it's you know, to some extent, maybe a bit of both, because if we think about uh, policies that were pursued, you know, in the post-Soviet region by some of the governments, like, for example, the early post-Soviet government in Georgia, which was very, like, radical and nationalistic, right? I think that, you know, it's not to say that Russia cannot have legitimate concerns about cultural and other rights of, you know, Russian-speaking minorities, but I think... Um, Rob is right. Oftentimes, it was not really about Russian-speaking minorities. It was pursuit of certain geopolitical objectives that were sometimes couched in terms of protecting Russian-speaking minorities. And I think this is a little bit of an unfortunate situation because that makes um, the governments in these non-Russian former Soviet states to be very oftentimes skeptical or outright kind of rejecting of any um, concerns coming out of Russia basically seeing that it's not about, you know, concerns for the cultural rights of minorities, really, but it is about Russia trying to advance uh, certain geopolitical objectives, right? Now, on this point of a sort of Russian defensive position on NATO membership, again, I'm not sure I will necessarily agree with this, because if we think about what, what likely would have happened in Ukraine had Russia not invaded Crimea, right? Tor already was saying how NATO membership was incredibly unlikely, it still remains unlikely, that either Ukraine or Georgia would actually join NATO. And say, like, if Russia did not overreact the way it did in 2014, what would have likely been the situation now? The situation now likely would have been exactly what existed in Ukraine through the early 1990s. There was large Russian-speaking kind of pro-Russian part of the population, and every president managed to discredit himself and basically lose elections. So just as Poroshenko coming to power, say, if he came to power in 2014 with his pro-Western course and then a lot of corruption, in the next election, more pro-Russian candidates would have won. So Russia had perfect ability, at least in the case of Ukraine, to continue to exercise its influence as it had in the past through various oligarchs, through kind of using 
the Russian friendly part of the population, right? Um, and, and it basically deprived itself of its opportunity. So in a way, kind of trying to make itself more secure, I would say it probably made itself less secure, at least in Ukraine, because now for the first time, we have majority of Ukrainian population that is very anti-Russian government, very anti any kind of political or other union with Russia. And that's the consequence of 2014. Now, I'm not a security specialist, but I would say, you know, it is questionable whether Russia really increased its security taking the actions that it did in Ukraine in 2014. And it could have very well been in a position that it was during Yanukovych presidency, during Kuchma presidency, and even during Yushchenko presidency, who was kind of pro-Western, but again, he had to deal with large pro-Russian electorate and so forth. So I will maybe leave at that. So we've been discussing the conflict in eastern Ukraine, and optimistically, there were talks and an agreement to a ceasefire that should take place by the end of this month. While there have been several ceasefires that haven't taken root, we can always offer hope that this one will finally begin the process of resolution to this conflict. Thank you very much to our panel. Thank you for your insights into this conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Robert English is Professor of International Relations at the University of Southern California. He is the author of Russia and the Idea of the West. Oksana Cheval is the Associate Professor of Political Science at Tufts University. She is the author of Migration, Refugee Policy, and State Building in Post-Communist Europe. And Tor Bukval is the Senior Research Fellow at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. He is the author of Fighting on Behalf of the State, the Issue of Pro-Government Militia Autonomy in the Donbass War. And that's it for today's show. Thank you to all of our guests and to those who make this program possible. To Sad Dongre, our webmaster, contributing host, Doug Becker, Ankine Arasian, Melissa Chiprin, Mike Hurst, and Tim Page. Most of all, thank you for listening. If you missed part of the show, you can check out our archives at scholarcircle.org, kpfk.org, and please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Armudian, and we'll see you next week.